Okay, hello everyone. So this lecture is going to be about the Macedonian Empire. And as we talked about previously, I had mentioned that after the Peloponnesian War, there were a number of um, Greek city-states that rose to the top in terms of power, and then they were all attacked by other ones and brought down. And what it ended up doing is really weakening Greece and really um, making the situation perfect for them to be invaded um, by the Macedonians, who were their northern neighbors. Um, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking about Philip II, who was a king, and then um, a bit about his son, the Alexander the Great, who's probably the, one of the more famous characters from this particular story. Um, in terms of the Macedonian Empire, which again is north of, of Greece, it had Illyrians, Thracians, as well as Greeks living there. Um, and what really helped um, Philip II invade Greece was that they also spoke a dialect of Greek. So it wasn't like they were totally different people um, at all. Um, they worshiped Greek gods, they had Greek names. Um, now they did have kings, which is you know similar to Sparta and some other city-states, but there were enough similarities that it wasn't a big cultural change when Greece was invaded by um, the Macedonians. And then here's just a map showing you mostly of the Persian Empire, because we're going to talk about them in just a minute. Um, but here's Macedonia. Now, one thing I do want to point out here is this is where Alexander the, Greek, Alexander the Great came from, and then he conquered this entire area. Okay, just a little bit about Macedonia in general. So you've got a king named Archelaus who ruled till um, uh, 399, and he established um, a city called Pella as their capital. Now, he did a lot of trading with the Greeks, especially with the Athenians, and then built up his country. Now, Philip II was born, and of course, and I just mentioned he's the father of Alexander the Great. What's really interesting is that he had spent quite a bit of time in Greece itself. Um, one thing he learned was Greek military tactics, which of course he then used um, against them in just a bit. But he took these same tactics and fought against his northern neighbors, the Illyrians and the Thracians, um, with this type of uh, military setup, as you can see on, on this particular slide. Now, what happens here with these military soldiers is that they're, they're all lined up. They have these very long pikes. The front ones bring the pikes down. They fight, and then they peel off, and then the next set drop their pikes and fight, and then peel off, and they keep keep doing that. And it was very, uh, very successful military process. Now, I'm going to be talking about quite a few names. It's not exactly important to remember all of these names, but Philip married a woman named Olympias, and then Alexander was born. Now, what brought Macedonia into Greece? This is something called the Sacred Wars, where uh, a city-state named Phocis um, probably did something wrong and they invaded a little bit of the territory of Delphi. Now we've talked about Delphi before, which is where the Delphic Oracle is. It was probably one of the more famous spots in ancient Greece. Um, they invaded and the Greeks ended up asking Philip II for help. Um, he called himself the champion of Apollo. Now what he ended up doing is invading Greece, taking care of Phocis, and then he never left. Um, what he ended up doing is reorganizing something called the Thessalonian League, which we didn't talk about. Um, now, some people weren't very happy about this. You've got Demosthenes, an Athenian. He wrote um, these works called the First, Second, and Third Philippics, which are against Philip. Um, he did not like the fact that this Macedonian king had come down and taken control of, um, of all of Greece. Now, you've got these different types of peace that were made, um, and then these were um, broken. And eventually what happened is Philip II went all the way into the southern part of, of mainland Greece and then took control of the whole, the whole area. Philip formed something called the Corinthian League, um, probably because that's how it was done um, in the past with all these different leagues, and he was installed as the commander or the hegemon. Now, if you remember back when we talked about the Persian Wars, where Darius and Xerxes uh, both went in and controlled parts of Macedonia, what's going to happen here is that Philip creates the Corinthian League primarily to 
um, declare war on Persia in an act of revenge against what the Persians did back in the Persian War. So that was not forgotten in Macedonia. Um, um, Philip II died in 336 BC, and then Alexander uh, became king. And of course, this is Alexander the Great we're talking about. Here's a very famous uh, mosaic that's found in Pompeii um, with Darius, or sorry, Alexander the Great fighting Darius III. Um, it's an interesting um, uh, mosaic. This is not my picture, although I was in the same room that this mosaic was. I was looking at all the Pompeian stuff, and behind me, I glanced behind, and I saw this beautiful mosaic. wasn't paying attention to it, so anyway, I had to find this picture. But um, there are some really interesting stories about Alexander the Great, because he, he, as far as we can tell, he started to think of, of himself as a god. Um, and I'm not going to read this to you, but this is just a little story about how Philip um, um, got together with Olympia, uh, got her pregnant, and then some of the, the things that happened after this to sort of show that Alexander the Great was, was a god. So anyway, you can stop the video and, and read, read through this interesting story by Plutarch. Um, anyway, you've got um, a cast of characters in the story of Alexander. You've got Olympia, his mother. You have a man named Hephaestion, who is his lover, boyfriend, whatever you want to call it. And it's really interesting because Alexander knew of the Iliad, and he saw himself as the new Achilles. And if you remember, we had um, didn't really talk about this in this class, but Patroclus was a character in the Iliad who was very close to Achilles, and it was thought that he was his partner, boyfriend, whatever you want to call him. Um, so anyway, Alexander had um, the same. Now, he loved Homer, was fully aware of everything going on, and he was also taught by the very, very famous Greek uh, philosopher Aristotle. Now, Alexander did not come into power um, not knowing anything about it. So he was a regent, which is a person put in charge while, while his father was away fighting. Um, in 336, he goes to Greece. Now, Athens at this point has a public thanksgiving, um, welcoming him into um, Athens. And then he, just like uh, Philip II was, he was made hegemon or commander of the Corinthian League. Then he decides to fulfill the revenge that his father, Philip II, wanted in terms of invading Persia. Now, lots of things start happening all at the same time. Um, Obviously, Persia didn't like Alexander, so they, they sent money to Greece and tried to get them to rebel against Alexander. And what that would ultimately do is keep him in Greece, and that didn't quite work out. Um, Alexander took his role very seriously. Uh, we know in 335 there were rumors about his death, and Thebes had a public celebration, thinking that they finally got rid of this guy who was taking over or had taken over Greece. Um, Alexander was not dead, and he went into Thebes and destroyed it in, in revenge. Um, the following year, he then took his military, part of the Corinthian League, a lot of Greeks with him, Macedonians with him, crossed the Hellespont and moved into Persian territory. Now, it's really interesting here, and you see multiple military leaders throughout history doing this when they invade a different country. Um, he ended up taking a number of different people who weren't soldiers, like engineers to build bridges and things like that, architects to help build those bridges or buildings, surveyors. He took historians with him because he wanted his story um, to be told. And then what he would do is he would take over these various cities and he would leave governors in the cities so that he didn't have to stick around. He could just keep going. Now, there are a bunch of battles here that aren't totally important, but uh, what is important is sort of the, the line that he took to invade Persia. So he, couple, he had a couple battles with Darius III, and in each time, Darius III would retreat. And for Alexander, that meant he won the war and was in control of Persia. Um, the last battle he had, a um, uh, really big one at 330, uh, in 331, the Battle of Galbamela, um, Darius III ended up bringing his entire family with him to watch him supposedly defeat Alexander the, uh, the Great, and it didn't work. Darius III lost again, and he fled, um, and he fled without his family. So Alexander the Great captured the entire Persian royal family. Um, he went into Egypt, made that part of his territory, and then by 326, he had made his way all the way to India. 
And then what he ended up doing is going down the Indus River, um, Indus River Valley um, to the ocean, and he ended up turning around. He sent some of his troops by ship, but he ended up marching back into uh, Persian, Persian territory. This is a very famous coin showing Alexander attacking a Indian king named Porus. Um, and it's an interesting coin. You can see Porus sitting on his elephant fighting Alexander. And on the other side, you've got um, Alexander with a scepter and a thunderbolt. And um, I can't remember if I showed you a statue, a very famous statue of Zeus show in the same pose. So Alexander the Great was trying to show himself off as being a Zeus-like character. Now, Alexander, when he was taking over all of these areas, he wasn't really interested in like total domination. Um, he wanted, um, he obviously left governors, um, left some troops in each place to sort of hold things while things settled down. Um, in 324, he held a mass marriage between Persians and Macedonians and Greeks in, hoping, in his hopes to bring people together. Um, in 324, in the same year, Hephaestus, Hephaestus, um, Hephaestus was killed, and this really impacted um, Alexander uh, quite heavily. And then he ends up dying in 323. There's a lot of scholarship out there about what happened to him, whether he drank himself to death or was killed and so on. But anyway, he was only 33 years old after conquering this massive territory really out of revenge for what happened in the Persian Wars. Now, things rapidly fell apart for this, this empire after the death of Alexander. And it's partly because he didn't have really any adult heirs. So he had a couple of wives. He had a son named Philip III. Um, and then he, um, after his death, his other wife had a son named Alexander IV, or Philip III, and then uh, uh, another son named Alexander IV. Now, it was decided that a, a a general named Perdiccas would be the regent. So he would take care of these two until they were old enough to rule on themselves. And, themselves. and it didn't quite work. So that entire territory was broken apart by the generals who could not agree really on anything. So Perdiccas, and I give you the list here, Perdiccas ruled Babylon and Asia. A general named Antipater um, controlled Greece, Macedonia. A general named Ptolemy, um, who started the Ptolemy, Ptolemaic uh, era and ruled Egypt, and then a, um, a general named Antigonus ruled the rest of it. Um, these generals did not get along with each other, and they revolted. Um, sometimes the Greeks would revolt against these generals. Sometimes the generals would invade other generals' territories. Um, not totally important. I mean, after, you know, I've given you a lot of names again. You've got... Um, people wanting to be in control of Alexander the Great's son. Um, but you've got um, these sons being killed um, probably by, one son was killed probably by the machinations of Olympia, Alexander's mother. Um, so you've got Philip III being killed, and then Alexander IV is killed by Cassander in 310, and that ends the line of Alexander. Um, what that means is that this entire territory was then split up. So this is a, a pretty busy map, but you've got the Ptolemies in Egypt to Palestine. You have the Seleucid, this, which starts the Seleucid Empire in Syria, Palestine, and the other areas of Asia Minor. And then you've got the Antigonids, who ruled Asia Minor and Macedon ultimately Macedonia. Um, so again, Alexander the Great um, had a massive empire didn't hold it very long because of his death and his generals weren't interested in having one empire. So they split the entire region up. And just like, I mean, I'm getting ahead of myself and I won't really talk about this in, in this class very much, but this really weakened the entire area, including Greece. And what will happen, and I'll talk about this very briefly in the next lecture, is its takeover by the new empire that was growing, or the new group that was growing, the Romans, off to the far west.